Welcome to The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpy, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and columnist who has over a million listeners around the world. His podcast and YouTube shows draws guests and audiences across the political spectrum. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy. We have a very unique program today. It's actually a reprise of an earlier episode that we published as a podcast in October of 2020, uh, forecasting what might happen during this pandemic. Um, it was such a strong prognostication and, you know, frankly, prophetic that I think it bears listening again because I think there's some very powerful messages here and many that really talk about what we've been trying to accomplish on the common bridge. We have been fighting this terrible virus. And today I grieve for those that I know that have been lost to the virus and those that are struggling with it and those whose lives will never be the same because of it. Now, you know, one would think that a health threat like this that affects everyone might, you know, cause us to pause and, you know, appeal to our better nature and come together. Um, you know, we know that hasn't occurred. And, you know, I'm just asking all my listeners and all my viewers to please weigh the risks. Uh, on one hand, you've got uh, vaccines and safety measures. And on the other hand, potentially a full-blown case of COVID-19. And what risk there might be on one side with what devastating impacts there are might be on the other side. I encourage you all to get quality information and understand your risks and act accordingly. So today we want to talk about public health policy. And public health policy, as we've said many times, is supposed to be scientific data uh, to assess the risk, uh, define some goals, what we're trying to accomplish with public health, and get to sound public policy. And back in October of 2020, on episode 67 of the Common Bridge, we had the Great Barrington Declaration. And we're going to hear it again about what one of the authors, Dr. Martin Koldor, said about public policy. And he talked about what might happen to schools and mental health and to the length of this duration and the depth of it. And when you go through this and consider what he was putting out, along with two other very highly qualified people. And you wonder, why was he cut off from Twitter? Why was he marginalized? Was he, why was he mar mocked by people who didn't come up with the right answer? So I ask you to please listen carefully. Uh, I think you're going to hear a voice of reason. And ask those that we elect, the bureaucrats they empower, and the reporters that don't report and demand that they do better. And now here's episode 67 of The Common Bridge with our guest, Dr. Martin Koldorf. Our guest today is a professor of medicine at Harvard University in the division of pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacoeconomics, and is a biostatistician and epidemiologist with expertise in detecting and monitoring infectious disease outbreaks and vaccine safety evaluations. Dr. Martin Koldorf earned a master's degree and doctorate from Cornell University with a concentration in applied probability and statistics. He has developed new statistical and epidemiological methods for disease surveillance, many of which are relevant for cancer research and for public health. And as you will hear in today's episode of The Common Bridge, he is consulted by governments, agencies, and other policymakers regarding disease outbreaks. In the news recently, as a co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, Dr. Martin Koldorf teamed with two other subject matter experts for this important view on the COVID-19 pandemic. The co-authors are Dr. Sunetra Gupta, professor at Oxford University, who is an epidemiologist with expertise in immunology, vaccine development, and mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. Also, Dr. J. Bhattacharya, a professor at Stanford University Medical School, who is a physician, epidemiologist, health economist, 
and public health policy expert focusing on infectious diseases and vulnerable populations. And they recommend an approach they call focused protection. And we'll discuss the Great Barrington Declaration. We'll talk about what some of its critics have to say. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot. So welcome, Dr. Martin Koldorf. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Rich. I appreciate it. Let's let our audience get to know you a little bit. Tell us something about yourself. What were some of your early days and academic preparation and perhaps some of the professional work you've done? Uh, well, I have two areas of uh, research that I'm heavily involved in. One is for a couple of decades now, I have worked with uh, infectious disease outbreaks and specifically how to detect them quickly and then how to monitor them on a, public, uh, on a population basis. And I have developed methods that are used by uh, most, almost all the state health departments in the U.S. and by CDC and similar agencies around the world to look at the, the geographical distribution of disease and disease outbreaks. And for example, these methods was used uh, five years ago when there was a indigenous disease outbreak in New York City in Bronx. Uh, it was this method that first detected that outbreak. And is this something that you have generated through your teaching or your research at Harvard? Uh, yes, through the research, yeah. And what is your job today? What occupies your time? So that do occupy my time. I had a, just before this, I had a conference call with uh, people at the New York City Health Department talking about uh, how uh, their work on uh, monitoring COVID-19 in New York. I also work a lot with vaccine safety. Uh, so after a vaccine is approved, we still want to monitor its safety because if it's something common adverse reaction, we will know it before it's approved and then not approve it. But we still want to monitor rare but serious adverse reactions. So I'm working with CDC to set up the plans for monitoring the safety of any future COVID-19 vaccine that might come around. Well, that broad-based 360-degree look from a learned perspective, is something that listeners to the Common Bridge tell us that they like. Today, Newton's third law says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And since the pandemic outbreak, we as a society have taken many actions. I know some of our listeners are ardent supporters of those actions, and still many chafe at the restrictions. Today, we're going to look at the actions and the reactions to policies to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. I anticipate some education and some uh, policy ideas. So Martin, if I may call you that, in episode yes, 38 please. of The Common Bridge, which was published in April, April 27th this year, Judge Milton Mack talked that even at that early date, we had already seen a significant uptick in suicides, a 50% increase in domestic violent cases, as well as a host of acute mental illness cases. And he linked them to the existing stay-at-home orders that were, as we now know, in their early stages. I read in your fascinating paper, The Great Barrington Declaration, which we have placed on the website, richardhelpy.com, that your group, is alarmed by things like lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer cancer screenings, and as reported locally here in Michigan, fewer cancer treatments, and deteriorating mental health, all which lead to a greater excess mortality now and in years to come. And tragically, the working class and the younger members of society are carrying the heaviest burden of these policies. And indeed, students that are out of school I think you characterize as a grave injustice. Other analysts are now saying that sustained lockdowns are the luxury of the rich, people who have the time and the resources for telehealth, people who are employed in jobs they can do from home, people who have childcare, technology, and space for remote schooling. You and your colleagues have studied the pandemic and policy reactions. So remember that our audience are not seasoned scientists. So can you explain to us what is the Great Barrington Declaration? Is it more than herd immunity, as some critics say? And just maybe fill us in, what problem is the Great Barrington Declaration addressing? How are you hoping to solve it? And why are you and your group the ones to solve it. Uh, so thank you. So two principles of public health that has been thrown out the window with this pandemic is the following. 
One is that you can't look at a single disease only. You have to look at health overall. So we can't just focus on COVID-19. We also have to focus on all this collateral damage that the measures that have been put in place is causing and that you, uh, you, you described. The other principle, the second one is, we can't just look short term, we have to look long term. So with the general lockdown, we can push the COVID-19 into the future. We can, minim we can reduce the number of deaths uh, uh, this month and next month. But with the pandemic, with COVID-19, it's gonna catch up with us sooner or later. So we are pushing it into the future and doing that makes it actually more difficult to protect the older high-risk groups because instead of isolating themselves for, let's say, three months, they are now, we are in a situation where they have to isolate and protect themselves for over a year, and it could be even longer than that. And that makes it, it's both inhumane to do that, but it also makes it much more difficult to be successful with it. So that's putting them at higher risk and therefore will have higher mortality because of that. So these two principles have been thrown out the window, and that's why we're speaking up and instead suggesting a focus protection. And this is nothing revolutionary or novel or new, because it's the same thing of protecting uh, the high-risk people that was in almost every pandemic preparedness plan that different countries had prepared uh, before we knew this was coming because we knew that sooner or later there will be a pandemic and there will be more pandemics after this. But all of those pandemic preparedness was, plans was basically thrown out the window with the exception of Sweden, I would say. I hope that we get a chance to spend some time on Sweden and perhaps some lessons from other countries. I do want to let our listeners know that prior to coming on, we did ask Dr. Koldorf about conflicts relative to funding or boards or patents or publications or promotions, and he has no conflicts. This is a man who is serving in the public health. And with that background, what was the impetus to producing the paper? Who said, let's write this paper and publish it? So the three of us have been trying to uh, uh, come out with this message for a long time, since March and April, um, and not with much success in the beginning. I think in September, it started to be a little bit more, uh, we were a little bit more able to get out this message. But when one person say these things, it will often be dismissed uh, as some strange person who is uh, not following the scientific consensus, which was very strange to us because ever since the beginning, what the media was talking about the scientific consensus was things that we did not agree with. And we all uh, uh, have all worked in this area for a long time. Uh, Dr. Sunetha Gupta is in my view, the world's preeminent infectious disease epidemiologist. So somehow, other people were listened to instead of what I thought was the most prominent people. So we thought that if we get the three of us together, then we can explain that. And the original idea was actually to make a video, which we did also, and which can be found on the gbdeclaration.org website, to have the three of us explain what's going on. And then by being three of us instead of only one, that that might have a bigger impact. And then we decided to, to uh, when we were gathered together for the video, we decided to also to write this declaration, which we did in basically two, two and a half days. Well, I think it's a fascinating document, and I hope everyone does go to the website, which we have put a link up on our website. And I was struck that all three of you have devoted your careers to protecting people. I think it's very balanced and it's got a deep a scientific foundation. But just mind you, my disclaimer is that I'm coming from a lay perspective. Dr. Koldorf, other policy analysts have reached different conclusions or opinions. So some think that just continued stay-at-home orders are the key until the virus, I don't know exactly how it's supposed to leave, that's going to either burn out or we have a, a vaccine. And others are saying, well, you know, we, we just need to be, have more aggressive you know, masking and social distancing protocols, and that'll be a permanent part of life, including American life. And still others that say there will be no exit from this pandemic until we get a vaccine. How does the conclusions put forward by the great Barrington Declaration either agree with or differ from these other policy? Well, we differ from those. And uh, the key 
this lot we don't know about COVID-19, but there's something we, we do know that's very important that we have known since March. And that is while anybody can get infected, whether young or old, the risk for mortality is greatly different by age. And while people know that, they don't really know, I think, realize how enormous the difference is, because it's not a twofold difference in risk or fivefold or tenfold. It's not even a hundredfold difference in risk. Uh, it's more than a thousandfold difference in mortality risk between the oldest and the youngest. And that's an enormous difference. So for older people, COVID-19 is more dangerous and more serious than the annual flu. So they have to be much more careful and we have to be, do much more to protect them than we're doing now. And that's a, uh, that's a huge failure uh, in uh, several of the states in the United States that failing to protect the old who are the high risk. Uh, instead, these states were protecting the young, the students, who don't need protection because for children, COVID-19 is typically asymptomatic or just mildly symptomatic and uh, it's much less dangerous than the annual flu for children. So every year, the annual flu kills between 200 and 1,000 children in the United States, uh, which is very tragic. Uh, depending on the number depends on if it's a severe or less severe uh, flu season. Uh, but we don't close the schools for that. So for COVID-19, the risk is much less. And for example, if you look at the for children and the risk for children, there was one country uh, in Western, one West, major Western country that didn't close all the schools. And that was Sweden, where schools were open from daycare age one to age 15. So there were 1.8 million children in Sweden who through the height of this pandemic went to school every day. And among these 1.8 million children, there were exactly zero that died from COVID-19 during this time period. Uh, there were a handful of, of children who were hospitalized, but they all survived. So for children, this is not a serious disease. And it's actually better if they get infected as a child than if they get infected later on when they are at higher risk. For teachers also, they looked at the teachers because there's concern that maybe the kids are infecting the teachers. And the teachers in Sweden, with, with going to school and having all the children around them, had the same risk of COVID-19 as the average of other professions. Now, since some other professions actually were working from home, if you compare the teachers with other professions that went to a work site, the teachers were actually at less risk. Uh, and it has also been confirmed from studies from a very interesting study in Iceland where they looked at genetics of the virus to see who is actually infecting who. And they found that while parents will often infect children, uh, children will not infect parents very often. So this all shows that the teachers are not that the teachers are more at risk from other teachers than they are from the students. So it would make sense. I think schools should be open for in-person teaching. I think it's uh, a grave injustice we're doing to the children. They need schools, for, not only for education, but also for their physical and mental health. So it's a grave injustice we're we imposing on, on our children right now. The teachers, uh, they should try to maybe stay away from other teachers because that's where the risk is. If they are above 60, they are sort of in a high-risk group. So there it might sense to have them work from home, either teach from home or help other teachers with grading exams and essays or homeworks. So that kind of accommodations should be done. And if a child is sick, we don't have to test them. But if they have a cough or running nose, send them home until they don't have no symptoms. But there's no reason to test children or university students. There's no public health reasons for that. There's absolutely no public health reasons to keep uh, uh, children away from in-person teaching, and it does much more damage in terms of the health of these children than uh, almost no min minuscule risk uh, from going to school. Um, it's really interesting what you're talking about in terms of the school children. And today, colleges and universities, as they've begun to reopen, have had increasing infections. One learned healthcare experts said, you know, we've moved the infections from the nursing home to the frat house. But these infections have not followed with hospitalizations and deaths. And of course, you know, those students are going to return home at some point. Any thought to the risks at the college and university level? 
I think they are higher risk uh, driving home uh, to their parents uh, from having a car accident. I have a I have a son. He's 18. He's in college, and I'm much more concerned about uh, traffic accidents than COVID-19. Uh, I'm very. If we have cases in nursing home, that's a huge problem because they are very at high risk. So there are many that are going to die. So that's a major problem, a major risk that we have to prevent. Do everything we can to prevent that. Uh, that there are cases at university campus where they are hanging out with each other and maybe infecting other students, they are at so low risk that this is not something I'm worried about. Uh, there's no need to go on testing these children or these students. Uh, if they are sick, if they have a runny nose or coughing, they could stay in their dorm room until they're well, but they should be able to enjoy uh, the life as normally and uh, there has been suicides in the colleges, and uh, we are again, just like with the school children, we are putting a, a lot of burden on these kids and doing things to them that we shouldn't do to them. I'm sure you're being troubled by the impacts on disadvantaged communities, particularly when it comes to schooling, that the students may not have the technology resources they may not have a place to work from home. They may have to care for younger siblings. The parents in those homes may not have transportation because they have to be on the bus or the subway. And worse, conversely, I'm seeing more and more affluent families almost embrace the lockdown restrictions. You know, they're moving to a remote location or they're actually doing RV traveling. And I just wonder, you know, are we going to be at some risk someday of just settling into a new normal of restrictions without a clinical basis, just because it's an attractive lifestyle and furthering divisions within the country? But perhaps that's for another day. Martin, when you look at some of the earlier policies, and, you know, back in March, the White House was talking about aggressive guidance to combat the COVID, 15 days, slow the spread. Of course, that became more days. Were any of those policies effective? I know that hospitalization rates came down, the ability to resupply with PPE and the like. But when you kind of look back at some of those policies that were put in place, are those still tools that we have available to us at the right time? So in the beginning of the pandemic uh, in the spring, there was a need to flatten the curve because we don't want everybody to go to the hospital at the same time because then we can give people the proper health care. So Italy and Spain had problems where they had so many cases that they couldn't provide proper health care to every, all the COVID-19 patients. And that was important to avoid that problem in other places of the world. And the rest of the world were by and large uh, successful, that there were uh, free capacity so everybody who needed uh, the care could get it. So to flatten the curve makes sense there. If you have to take drastic measures for two or three weeks to do that, I think the damage from that is sort of limited compared to the benefit of making sure that the hospitals are not overburdened. So there was consensus among epidemiologists that that was uh, the right thing to do. But then somehow we silently slipped into this idea that this pandemic can be suppressed and get down to zero cases. And that became the goal of governments. Uh, then sort of just doing lockdowns to push this everything into the future, which uh, can decrease short-term uh, mortality, but increases long-term mortality, uh, both from COVID-19 as well as from other uh, aspects of health. So that was, I think, a major mistake done by a number of governments around the world. A very tragic mistake. We've read a number of comparisons to the Spanish flu of 1918. And now we're beginning to enter the winter season in North America, typically the cold and flu season. Are there parallels for a second wave of COVID-19, perhaps worse than the first? Any parallels between the Spanish flu and COVID-19? Um, there are some similarities. Uh, I think uh, the Spanish flu was worse than COVID in terms of mortality, and I don't think we're going to reach that same mortality. Uh, another thing that was much worse with Spanish flu was uh, it was actually young and middle-aged people who were affected the most. In this case, uh, the children are safe. So as a parent, I have three children. Parents, the children are my major concern in terms of safety. So it was a huge relief back in back uh, in the early days when I realized that, no, 
this is going to be serious. It's going to be a pandemic from the world, but my children are not going to, are going to be safe. So that was a huge relief uh, at that time. But in terms of the second wave, I think those places which sort of had a successful lockdown in the sense that they managed to keep keep the disease out, there the people are still susceptible. There's very little immunity in the population. So I would expect that in those places, there will be uh, COVID-19 coming up now. And the key then is that we protect the older high-risk people uh, during that time when there's a lot of transmission in the community. Uh, and then once, uh, once there's enough immunity among the younger people, then the, the older people will also be protected by herd immunity, which has been become a sort of a bad word for some strange reason that I don't understand because herd immunity is actually something good in the sense that once enough people have been infected, those who are still not infected do not have much risk. So we can actually protect those. So it, it allows us to protect the high risk elder, uh, older people. Uh, by the fact that we have herd immunity. And herd immunity is not some strategy or something controversial because herd immunity is just scientific fact, scientific phenomena that's proven and that we will reach sooner or later with this COVID-19. That's unavoidable. Uh, it's just like gravity. So to discuss whether we're going to do a herd immunity strategy or not, it, every strategy will lead to herd immunity. So that's sort of absurd from an epidemiologist's point of view. It's like two pilots uh, up in the air talking about, oh, how should we get the plane down? Should we use the gravity strategy or some different strategy? Uh, gravity will ensure that the plane eventually will will uh, come down to the ground. And the, yes, the key thing is, how do you land the plane to minimize the casualty? Because you don't want everybody to die in the, in the plane crash. And it's the same thing with COVID-19. The focus should be, how can we minimize the mortality until uh, this pandemic is over. Uh, we haven't thought of it in those long-term perspective. We have thought about it minimizing short-term COVID-19 death, and that has been a disaster. And because of that, those places that sort of successfully, in quotation marks, was able to lock down to prevent the disease to come, it's my prediction that they will now see cases increase. I do think that we're seeing that. And as a former pilot, I do appreciate the analogy to flying. And that was one of the things. The airplane's coming down at some point. <laughs> Whether you control it or not, it's, it's going to come down. Yeah. I'm reading of a, a story in the medical journal, The Lancet, and they're saying that herd immunity is a, quote, dangerous fallacy unsupported by scientific evidence. They want to say there's no evidence for lasting protective immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 following a natural infection, and that they don't think it's actually practical to isolate parts of the population that might be vulnerable. You know, how do you keep the 65-year-olds away from their 10-year-old grandchildren and such? What do you say to those critics? So I disagree with them. Uh, so there were several points there. So if I forget some of them, uh, remind me. So one thing is, can we isolate the older high-risk group? So if they mean that we can't do it 100% and do it completely, then they are correct. That's impossible. And when we have a pandemic like this, there are going to be mortality. There are going to be death. That's unavoidable. It's absolutely impossible to, to prevent all deaths. And attempts to do that would actually lead to more deaths. But let's take a comparison. So what we have done now with the current strategy is we are protecting low-risk college students and low-risk professionals who can work from home, bankers, insurance agents, journalists like you, scientists like me. So those uh, more professional, uh, uh, more uh, uh, privileged people are being protected while the working class have to be out there working as a bus driver, as a janitor, working in the supermarket, etc., including those that are old. So the question is, did this separation work? Well, it didn't work 100% because there are some people in the professional class who have died. Uh, but it has worked to maybe 10, 90, 10% to 80, 20%. And we can look at uh, various studies. For example, there was a very interesting study from Toronto in Canada that before the lockdown, mortality was the same 
in all socioeconomic groups. But then after lockdown went in place, the higher socioeconomic groups, they flattened with the mortality, while the lower socioeconomic groups continued to rise until it then eventually sort of uh, came down again uh, because uh, increasing immunity. So we were actually, again in quotation marks, successfully to protect the more privileged professional class and uh, shifting the burden on the working class. So that was a success. And again, in quotation mark, because I think it's a terrible uh, outcome. Uh, so in the same way, we can do uh, what, what the Great Farrington Declaration is arguing for is we should do that separation instead of by uh, privilege versus working class. We should do it by age because that's where the risks are. We should protect all older people, whether or not they are a lawyer or a janitor, because they're all at high risk. And we should let younger people live the life, whether they are a banker or a bus driver, because they are at lower risk. So just as we were able to shift it from the privilege to the working class, it's also able to shift it from the old to the young. And that's what's going to minimize mortality. And it won't be done 100%. But if you can do it 2080, instead of having 50-50 to do it 2080 or 1090, that will reduce mortality. I think that the data as early as April, I know I was digging through data and said if you're under 45, uh, you don't have an underlying health condition, you're asymptomatic, and you aren't around at-risk populations, that you're probably good to just live your life. And of course, you know, be careful with your hand washing and distancing and the like, but get back out there. And I did notice that while the World Health Organization, the Director General, is quoted as saying that never in the history of public health has herd immunity been used as a strategy for responding to an outbreak, let alone a pandemic. And he said it's scientifically and ethically problematic. He agrees with you that sections of the world and sections of the country did experience additional surges of the virus as the restrictions are lifted. And I couple that with some other reading that I've done that said this policy, absent some effective vaccine, could last for three years. And I just don't know what the end game is with the continual lockdowns. And of course, the those advocating the lockdowns will say, well, there's going to be higher mortality, which is an arguable point. But, but the other part is this, and I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, that Oxfam produced a report that said, if we continue with these lockdowns, that 130 million people are going to be pushed to the brink of starvation due to supply chain disruptions. And I thought that through and I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. If we can't get farmers and truck drivers and boats that ship product, eventually that food supply chain will break down and then we're going to have an even more widespread problem. Is that consistent with what you're saying? Yes. And uh, it's a major, major concern. And I was actually on television in India this morning and in South Africa a couple of days ago. And there you have situations where uh, poor people, they, they, live, they make a living uh, selling uh, uh, food or toys uh, in the market. And with the lockdown, the rug was uh, pulled out of them. And we have, uh, because of the lockdowns in these countries, we have children who are not starving, and that should not ever happen. Uh, so uh, this this uh, pandemic is worldwide because the virus is worldwide. It affects all of us, but the collateral damage from the lockdown is also worldwide, and it affects uh, the poor and the working class the most. I think that's a great jumping off point to perhaps some lessons from elsewhere in the world. You did make mention of, of Sweden. Uh, we have had a couple of guests on the program that are in Asia, particularly in Hong Kong. The reports from Hong Kong is that because they've dealt with so many different viruses, that when there's a virus, they mask up, they stay apart, but they're basically back to normal. Are there lessons from other countries that we should take as a effective or perhaps as a warning? So I think Sweden is a good example uh, because 
they took a number of measures, but they didn't lock down. They didn't. They uh, uh, they didn't close the schools, for example. They didn't close restaurants and so on. And they were physical distancing practice, and they banned large gatherings for a little while, and so on. Uh, but in, in Europe now, we see emerging problems in many countries. So they are now reinstituting lockdown measures again. While Sweden, who for a while had a higher mortality rate, but now it's less than both the US and the UK, they are continuing to gradually release, limit the, the restrictions. And they never had severe restrictions in the, in the first place. So I think that's a good example that you can get through a pandemic while still keeping schools open, while keeping businesses open and having more normal lives. I am a native of Sweden, so I talk to my brother and sister there and other people in Sweden and life is fairly normal. And uh, they might still have another bump because I think there are certainly some areas of Sweden that wasn't that badly hit. So my guess is that there will still be a bump uh, maybe during this winter season, but uh, I think it will be much less than the other countries who went for earlier lockdown with much less disruption to society, and especially in, uh, in terms of the public health and the well-being of both children and old people. One of the elements of this particular virus is the asymptomatic spread or community spread. And in the early stages here in North America, there were cases that were discovered uh, on the West Coast, and they could not tie them back to travel from China or from Europe. Is the fact that this virus spreads asymptomatically, does that make us respond differently than we may have responded with other pandemics and other outbreaks? Uh, yes. So one thing that's been discussed is contact tracing testing and isolation. And that is a very important method to deal with many infectious diseases. So for example, we had a few cases of Ebola in, uh, in the United States. And when that happens, it's critically important to quarantine the cases and then ask who were they in contact with and uh, talk to them and test them if they are sick and maybe put them in isolation as well. So this is a standard method that's done for, for many infectious diseases. But to think that that will work for COVID-19 is a delusion. And the reason, one of the reasons is what you're saying, there are many asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic cases. So we don't even know who, came, who brought it first to the US, and probably more than one. We don't know who brought it first to the UK. We don't know who brought it first to Italy. We don't know how brought it first to France. So if you can't track it like that, even uh, in, in, in such a setting, doing uh, contact tracing and so on is hopeless. And also because it's so widespread now that uh, it's a hopeless system. And it's actually a very damaging thing to do to try contact tracing for COVID-19. And the reason is that now there are some places who are, who are doing it. And I've talked to at least two people who are involved in this. And they are saying that most people, when they call them up, say, well, I have been home all the time. I haven't met anybody because they don't want to sort of snitch on their uh, on their friends or neighbors. Mm. And then there are a few who tell them everything of all the hundreds of people they've met during the last week or so. But it's not helpful for COVID-19, but it reduces the trust that people have in public health authorities not wanting to cooperate with public health. So suppose now, three years from now, we have a different, much more dangerous disease like Ebola or something else for which we actually have to do that. It's going to be much more difficult now to do contact tracing for future diseases where it is the critical component to keep people safe. It's a couple of real quick questions here because I know this is on the minds of our listeners. How effective are masks? Uh, there has been a number of studies on that and I actually haven't read up on all of them. So my expertise is in infectious disease outbreak and how they move in society and among the population. So that's my area of expertise. There are other people who are experts on sort of the immediate transmission from person to person and whether the mask works or not. Fair enough. I would say well, I would say one thing that I think is very important from a public, which has to do with how it transmits in the population and for public health, and that is for older people, if they think that they are safe just yes, because they wear a mask and that other people wear masks if they are in the crowded setting 
that is very dangerous because they are not. Nobody's claiming that masks work so well that it gives complete protection. And we can see from the data that that's not the case. So older people who are at risk, they should not trust the masks to protect them if they are out with other people. And if it gives them a false sense of security, that would actually have a damaging effect on overall mortality to COVID-19. Is hand hygiene the only cleaning practice that we need? And No, everybody should wash their hands, whether you're young or old. So those things that are very simple to do and that help because hand washing helps, uh, that should be done. Uh, it's always good to be outside. Uh, ventilation for indoor spaces is good, not just for COVID-19, but for uh, everything, just for general health. So all those things are things that we should do uh, and that everybody should practice and it's very important to practice. So yes, wash your hands more frequently and when the pandemic is over, continue with those habits because they're also actually beneficial for influenza, rotavirus and many other diseases. Well, thank you. And I hope all my listeners hear that. Tell all your friends and family that too. As we begin to wrap up, if we take just a minute on vaccines, and I, I will tell you this as a lay person, that my perception is that we don't really know how this virus attaches. We don't know what it does. We don't know what the antibody reaction is. We don't know how effective antibodies are in fighting a future infection, and we don't know how long those antibodies might last. And again, this is my lay understanding. And I have a hard time understanding with that many unknowns how we can get a vaccine that's both safe and effective. It seems like we're aiming at a target that we can't even define. Is there a way you can help a person like me understand the vaccine research and what target we're shooting at and how it might work? So first with immunity. So there's clearly immunity. Uh, people who have had COVID-19 have immunity. There has been a few secondary infections, but considering the, the enormous amount of people who have been infected, that there are so few reports of secondary infections means that we have good immunity to this disease in the short run. And if you have antibodies, you are immune. But there's also many people who don't have antibodies who are immune because either they didn't develop them or they're no longer detectable. So the amount of people who are immune are more than the people who have detectable uh, measured antibodies. Now, we don't know how long antibodies will last because it hasn't been around for, for, for long enough. So for some diseases, we have lifelong immunity, but there are other diseases, including other coronaviruses, for which is not lifelong. But even if it's not lifelong immunity, we still have some protection from it. And maybe a second uh, infection will be, will be milder than, than now. So we will, as a population, we'll be going to a stage where this will be endemic. It's still present, but not pandemic in the sense we won't have major outbreaks of it. Now, those who argue that we can't reach herd immunity because we don't have immunity to national infection, if we can't get immunity to national infections, we're not going to get immunity from a vaccine because national infection is, is always the best, most effective way to get immunity. It's, of course, a more dangerous way because we could die from it, especially if you're, if you're old. But if natural infections that not generate immunity I think we would, if that wasn't the case, it is the case, but if that wasn't the case, then viruses would be, or vaccines would be sort of hopeless. Now, I think there are several dozen vaccines that are in the pipeline. And my guess is that most of those are not going to come out into the market because most of them are going to fail. But hopefully there will be at least one or two, or maybe three that will succeed. But we don't know. And uh, it's very hard to predict at this point. Uh, if we have a successful vaccine, it might not be 100%, it might be like 50%, because, for example, the flu vaccines, uh, they are only partially effective. So we don't know what the efficacy is and what the safety is at this point. If anybody says that, yes, I will get, in, get vaccinated or I will not get vaccinated, 
I would not say that because we don't have that information yet. Uh, I will wait to decide those things until we know something about the vaccine. And it could be that the vaccine makes sense for certain age group to be vaccinated, but not other age groups. I was anticipating that that might be the case. Say if you're over a certain age or you got asthma or diabetes or something, that it, it might be prudent uh, in the risk and reward. So this has been a great conversation. And if you had to sum up the cost of the focused protection and herd immunity to us as a society, I think the benefits you've called out, we're back to work, we're back socializing, we're back in education, and we're keeping those of us that are more vulnerable out of the line of fire, so to speak. Those are clearly benefits. On the other side of the ledger, what are some of the costs? You mean cost of the focus protection? The increased mortality in the short run would clearly be a cost. And I'm wondering if there are others that we might want to consider as we look at the policy. Yeah, so if we wanted to minimize short-term mortality, then we could do that with more intense lockdowns. Uh, but that's a cost of COVID-19 mortality because I think already now the cost of collateral damage, uh, including both morbidity and mortality, is already very high. So I don't even think that short-term mortality overall might be beneficial with lockdown at this point. Uh, I think that was the case in the spring, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't think there's evidence for that that would be the case now. There are, of course, costs in terms of protecting the elderly. For example, uh, nursing homes, those are the most high risk. Uh, we need to do more testing there. Uh, unless the staff is already immune because they've had COVID, uh, staff should be frequently tested so that they don't bring it into the nursing home. And it's not the residents. We, we should also test the residents, but it's not the residents that are the most important to test. It's the staff, and not for their benefit, but for the benefit of the residents, residents so that they don't bring in uh, the virus to the nursing homes. Also, we need to invest in testing uh, the visitors to nursing homes. We also need to do less rotation uh, of staff in nursing homes so that each residents don't see too many patients. And I know that Scott Atlas, who is the COVID advisor at the White House, he's been pushing for increasing these testing uh, to protect the elderly a lot. So he's done a great job with that. At the same time, we shouldn't waste money on testing school children or, uh, or college students. So that's one example. Another thing is those people who are in the 60s who are in the working age group, if they can work from home, yes, they should continue to work from home. But if they cannot, I think we have to help protect them so they can take a sabbatical for three to six months while the transmission is high in society. And we could, for example, say that, well, for, for four months or three or six or whatever, you can use your social security funds to take a sabbatical so that you don't have to go out there and and drive the bus or drive the cab or work as a janitor or work in the supermarket or any of the and a number of other things that younger people should take on at this moment. So there, there's a cost to that to make sure that they have can take that sabbatical using the social security funds. That's much less cost than the cost of the lockdowns because that's also an enormous economic cost. So uh, there are those things that uh, we have to do, and uh, hopefully the politician can uh, increase the protection that we are giving to the old and high-risk people. Well, I'd like to use a quote that I believe is attributable to Winston Churchill about Americans, that uh, Americans will always do the right thing after we've tried everything else. That's a good quote. I hope so, too. So I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll get to the right, right answer. Professor Koldorf, this has been a tremendously educational session, and I'm very, very grateful, and I know our listeners will be too. What didn't we cover today that perhaps we should have discussed? Uh, I think you've asked excellent uh, questions. Uh, so, uh... Are there any policy actions or personal actions that you would recommend people take today? Or perhaps, you know, what would be the worst thing we could do from a policy or a personal point of view? I think the one th if, if only one thing's changed, and I could pick one thing to change, and that is to open all the schools for in-person teaching for all the children. I think that is so important. If there's only one thing that changed, that would be one that, uh, that I picked. 
one thing that maybe is, is important to, to realize also is that public health decisions about these things are actually done at the state level. So it's the governors who have the responsibility for public health. So the CDC and the federal government, they can come in with advice and they can come in with resources to, for example, increase testing capacity and, and so on. But it's the state governments that have the responsibility for this. Some states have done a good job. For example, South Dakota has done an excellent job. Others has done a terrible job, which has led to many more deaths than would have been necessary had we instituted a focus protection plan from the very beginning. Well, thank you very much for that wrap up. We've been talking with Harvard University professor and researcher, Dr. Martin Koldorf. He is co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, a pivotal work for our time, the greatest issue that we face in the world today. This is Rich Helpy, your host of The Common Bridge, signing off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening again to Dr. Martin Koldorf. This pandemic has been absolutely devastating. We've seen Republicans, we've seen Democrats trying to run on a pandemic, use it to their own advantage. You've heard it. Now it's time we need to act. I know, look, we all have friends that want to stick their fingers in their ears and say, you know, trust the government and trust the report, even though both have repeatedly lied and obfuscated. Everyone has friends who think the opposite and want to trust speakers and politicians that reinforce their beliefs. The question is this, is it our government or is it belong to an elite group? Are we on such separate banks of a giant chasm with no hope of coming together? Are we buying the divide and we are, are we buying the dividers? Or can we talk about our common humanity, our interest in life, in health, and our interest in an open discussion? Please join us on the Common Bridge where we will discuss all these matters in a fiercely nonpartisan way. I don't promise to always have all the answers, but I do promise to get great guests, listen carefully to them, and present them to our listeners and viewers. Thank you for those that subscribe. Please tell your friends about The Common Bridge on the podcast and on YouTube TV. Looking forward to 2022. This is Rich Helpy on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Remember to rate us, review us, and comment about what you heard today and recommend us to your friends. Visit us at richardhelpy.com and sign up for special promotions. This broadcast was produced by Stunt3 Multimedia and is available on YouTube and all podcast directories. All rights are reserved by Richard Helpy.